I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Have you ever felt stuck? Stuck as in caught in a situation that no longer felt healthy or life-giving, maybe even no longer safe or sustainable. The other day I was listening to Becca Stevens, Episcopal priest and founder of Thistle Farms in Nashville, reflecting on what it means to be in a place where you feel stuck. She said, my, sense, my sister once told me people don't change unless it's more painful to stay the same. And I've been thinking about how it's that moment before you make that change and decide it's more painful to stay the same is the place where we feel stuck. And I want to say to you that place where we feel stuck is a fertile place. It's the place where we feel like, okay, I'm just about ready to make the change. I'm ready to invite the spirit in. I'm ready to recognize the longing of my own heart. So many he heroes throughout the history of the world in faith and struggles and justice and in truth were in a place where they were stuck and they were ready to make the hard decisions. As Becca Stevens concluded, I applaud everybody who recognizes I'm kind of stuck because that's a great place to be. Being stuck as a fertile place means seeing that we may need to be stuck in it, covered in and surrounded by fertilizer, if you will, to be able to know what steps are needed to grow something new out of that stuckness. That's just where we find Hagar, one of those heroes of the world Becca Stevens was talking about, heroes who were stuck and because of that stuckness were ready to make some hard decisions. Hagar was stuck in a very complicated situation that makes reality TV or soap operas look tame. <laughs> Let's look back for a minute at Genesis 16, the first of two times when Hagar's in the wilderness talking with God. In Genesis 16, Sarai, or Sarah, has Abram, or Abraham, lie down with her slave Hagar. The purpose was that Hagar would bear a child, hopefully a son, for Abraham, since Sarah could not, or at least that's what they thought at the time. But when it became clear that Hagar was carrying Abraham's child, when they got what they wanted, Sarah wasn't happy. She felt tender and perhaps more than a little jealous that someone else was doing the very thing she most wanted to do but could not. And so Sarah felt sensitive and thought now, now that Hagar was carrying Abraham's child, that maybe Hagar looked a bit too confident herself. Sarah perceived wrongly or rightly, we cannot know, that Hagar had looked upon her with contempt. And from that point on, the odds were even more stacked against Hagar, who was already living under pretty difficult conditions, first by being someone else's slave, and second, by being forced into having someone's child against her will. Now the story we hear today in Genesis 22 will make a bit more sense. When we get to this point in the story, Hagar's son Ishmael is old enough to have been weaned, and Sarah's son Isaac is old enough that Ishmael and Isaac are playing together. Abraham's two sons, one born to his wife's slave and one born to his wife. To Sarah, seeing Hagar and Ishmael reminded her of a desperate time and desperate measures. Seeing Ishmael reminded Sarah that Abraham would always have these two sons and that Ishmael would always be the oldest son, even if he were quote unquote illegitimate and not the heir. Sarah could not abide seeing these living reminders of her desperation, so she told Abraham to send them away. But where does this leave Hagar and Ishmael? Being sent out into the desert by Abraham, his father, the other person responsible for Ishmael being alive and in the world, and sending them out to fend for themselves in the wilderness with only a skin of water and some bread. If ever there were a situation in which someone would feel stuck, this is it, sent out alone and unprotected into the actual wilderness with nothing but a little bread and water. You can see why Hagar might have felt hopeless. The story of Hagar and Ishmael, as sad and complicated as it is, is a story of hope that comes out of hopelessness. 
Hagar was stuck in a seemingly hopeless situation. But in order for Hagar and Ishmael to move and grow into something better, they needed to be stuck for a minute in this. To use Becca Stevens' words, extremely fertile situation. In the midst of this, running out of water, seeing no wellspring in sight, Hagar feels desperate. And she does what many of us do when we feel all hope is lost. She cries out. Was she just getting out her frustrations when she cried out, or was she directing her words to God when she said, do not let me look on the death of this child? For a long time, interpreters thought this crying out was the point at which Hagar had given up. But reading more recent scholarship, I found that some Bible scholars see this cry as Hagar crying out to God. In one commentary, they argue the groanings of Hagar's self-talk constitute prayer. Hagar prayed this in a time of desperation. Here, she and her son were in the desert. They'd emptied the water skin and they'd finished the bread and there was no well or spring in sight. So in this moment of deep despair, Hagar decides to place Ishmael under a bush, perhaps to shade him, perhaps to place him more in the path of passers-by who might help him or even adopt him as their own. As these two scholars, Jansen and Noble, observed, by casting her son under a bush, Hagar has not abandoned him at all. How could she? Rather, her action is a final attempt to preserve his life through the mercy or interest of other passers-by. The stratagem is effective. Hagar and Ishmael are the objects of divine mercy, when God heard the voice of the boy and subsequently intervenes. In both stories of Hagar in Genesis 16 and 21, the call and response pattern of this vulnerable and oppressed mother and son activate God's compassionate sensory perception in a way that foreshadows the pattern of God and God's people in the Exodus yet to come and of the suffering Christ himself would face and his own cries to God in the midst of suffering and dying for us on the cross. But ultimately, the main point of this story being in the Bible is that God sees Hagar and God hears Hagar. And God sees Ishmael and hears Ishmael, where he is, as as the passage points out. In fact, that's what Ishmael means, God hears or God listens. The story of being stuck out in the wilderness but being heard by God is the story of when God's promise embedded in Ishmael's very name is lived out. God sees and hears Hagar and Ishmael and us where we are. No one knows better than God what a complex and sad situation this is for Hagar and Ishmael. But God shows up and God provides. For suddenly... Hagar realizes that there is water to be found there, that the bush is growing because it is near water. And this is the moment of transformation. It's hard to imagine being more stuck than a mother stranded in the wilderness with her child with no food or water left, no camel or donkey to ride out on, no friend or spouse to help them. But it is in this very moment of stuckness that Hagar gains clarity. As another scholar, Cornelia Horn, has pointed out, Hagar's story is one of oppression, abuse, and abandonment, but it is also one of a woman who finds favor with God and the strength to continue through the power of her own grief. It is her lament that fuels her transformation. It is only after Hagar cries out that she does not want to see the death of her child that Hagar sees that there is a wellspring nearby. And from the moment that she sees this, Hagar begins to have hope. And with that turning toward hope, their lives can begin anew. Ultimately, Hagar and Ishmael find their way out of their desperate situation in the wilderness. Hagar is able to raise Ishmael up to adulthood. Ishmael ends up becoming adept at the bow and so found a way to provide for himself and his family living in the wilderness of Paran. Then Hagar ends up finding her beloved Ishmael, a wife from Egypt, where Hagar herself is from, 
and she feels she can, in the end, rest easy in the knowledge that she did her best to give her son hope and a future, and that God is beginning to do what he said, which is that he will make a great nation of Ishmael. As Becca Stevens reflected, that place where we feel stuck is a fertile place. It's the place where we feel like, okay, I'm just about ready to make the change. I'm ready to invite the spirit in. I'm ready to recognize the longing of my own heart. The longing of Hagar's heart was that she wanted to be Hagar's mother, even though she hadn't chosen to become a mother on her own accord. But now that Hagar had this son, she was determined to raise him up into being a great nation, just as God had said. And God heard Hagar's cry and gave her a wellspring of motherly strength and determination from which she could do just that. Thanks be to God.